introduce my friend and valued colleague, Dr. Tove Skutna Pangas, who's an internationally famous educator. Says she's not a linguist anymore, but I also call her a linguist. Um, she is officially emerita, but still an extremely active teacher and scholar at two universities, the uh, Department of Languages and Culture at uh, Roskilde University in Denmark, where she received one of her two PhDs, and the Department of Education at uh, Avo Akademi University Vasa in Finland. Dr. Skutna Panga specializes in linguistic human rights, which she'll talk about with us today. Um, <clears throat> A more complete list of her interrelated interests includes minority education, language and power, uh, language policy, and the global spread of English, which, just so you know where she stands, she sometimes has named a killer language. Uh, she's a magnificent scholar and also a major contributor to um, the UN and other international organizations on, on the issues of human language rights and minority education. Few people have been able to produce such cogent argumentation in support of mother tongue uh, education as she has. In 2003, she won the prestigious Lingua Pax Prize. The Lingua Pax Prizes are awarded, uh, and I quote, to linguists, researchers, professors, and members of the civil society in acknowledgement of their outstanding work in the field of linguistic diversity and our multilingual education. Um, in a review of her 2000 book, Linguistic Genocide in Education, or Worldwide Diversity in Human Rights, published by Erlbaum, Colin Baker, who's the reviewer, describes Tove very well, I think. He says, Tove Skutnabukanga's contribution to the survival of more minority languages in the world in three decades has been truly unique. There are few, if any, who can match her commitment and passion dedication and utter humanity in writing about language minorities. To be so pioneering and original attracts doubts, particularly from those who wish to disassociate academic activity from political action. Tove Skutnab Kangas' deep, heartfelt commitment to language rights for dominated and repressed minorities is unchallengeable. Few who read Tove Skutnab Kangas can fail to be moved by her desire to gain justice for the marginalized and disenfranchised, the neglected and rejected. This is not just born out of political passion or righteous indignation. There is a remarkable breadth of scholarship, a range of reading across continents providing novel insights that makes the call for social justice powerful and compelling. From her early work in the 1970s to this challenging and powerful book, Tove Skutnab Kangas has made a formidable contribution to international awareness raising of the plight of language minorities. Skutnab Kangas has been a staunch advocate, particularly for language minority peoples wherever they exist. She has consistently demonstrated how politics and education reproduce the precarious status of such minorities. Few can justly claim to have made such an impact or been so influential in language struggles. Prolific as a writer, her lecturing campaigns and activity in many minority organizations have provided a powerful advocate for language minority peoples wherever they exist. That's Colin Baker. Um, this 2000 book of hers is just one of 21 books that Tove has written. She's also edited 12 books, written uh, 17 short monographs, 238 book chapters, 122 articles and journals, 36 book reviews and two book translations. And in case you wonder if she ever slows down, uh, I went to her website and noticed that she has one book in press, two in preparation, and 18 articles in press right now. <laughs> Tove is, of course, multilingual, speaking Finnish and Swedish as her mother tongues, and being fluent in English, German, and the other Scandinavian languages closely related to Swedish, Danish, and Norwegian. Her books and articles go even further in being multilingual. Her publications have been written in or translated into at least 29 different languages, including many of the minority languages that she seeks to protect. Um, Tove is also a person with many friends and has a very empowering way of relating to people. I first met her on the plane from Stockholm when we were flying up to the northern part of Finland for a conference 
that the Sami people were having on language revitalization, and I'd say we were friends within about 60 seconds. <laughs> Tove lives in Denmark with her husband, Dr. Robert Philipson. Um, her garden was what you were seeing here before, uh, before she uh, <laughs> changed the uh, picture. And um, um, Dr. Robert Philipson is also very involved in linguistic human rights, and she co-authors some of her works with him. She came to California, um, luckily, on, on her way in between different countries, as Claire was saying, and we're really lucky to have her stop by here before she uh, goes on to speak to us on linguistic human rights, some recent debates, intellectual games versus respect. Tove. It is completely impossible to say anything after such an introduction uh, because no, nobody can, uh, can sort of uh, come up to those standards. You can, you can see that uh, uh, one, of the, one of the very, very few good characteristics that I have is that I have wonderful friends. <laughs> okay. Uh, I'm not going to say terribly much about endangered languages and not either about linguistic human rights. Both of those, uh, I think, are clear from the debates that I'm going to discuss. And I'm going to take on some of the big gurus in the area of sociolinguistics, and I hope that it becomes clear that uh, what they are saying is, in my view, extremely dangerous for both uh, indigenous peoples and all kinds of minorities and for linguistic human rights. And uh, I'm not going to be ter terribly nice towards them, so I'm sure that I'm going to get some hate mail uh, fairly soon. Uh, this is uh, what I'm going to talk about. and. Uh, I started writing a paper which is at this point something like uh, over 70 pages and not finished about this, uh, for, for this lecture. And then I saw at some point it's completely impossible to finish the paper, so I started putting some few things onto a PowerPoint. And uh, uh, since uh, English is my fifth language in terms of order of learning, even if I think that I can manage fairly well in this awful, illogical, irrational <laughs> language with one of the most difficult grammars uh, that I know in Indo-European languages, uh, I'm going to read quite a lot of this because it's so difficult to be short in English if you speak about difficult things and if it is not your mother tongue or at least your second or third language. So there will be quite a lot of <laughs> reading. I'll start with an introduction with background quotes. And these quotes really show most of what I'm going to uh, tell you, most of what I believe in myself. This is uh, Deloria. Being guilty for remote sins is easy. Accepting responsibilities for current and future sins is difficult. It is this contemporary attitude toward Aboriginal peoples that must be changed, rather than compensation for past wrongs. The United Nations Human Development Report from 2004 links cultural liberty to language rights and human development in the following way. They argue that there is, and I quote, no more powerful means of encouraging individuals to assimilate to a dominant culture than having the economic, social, and political returns stacked against their mother tongue. Such assimilation is not freely chosen if the choice is between one's mother tongue and one's future. And this is, among other things, one of the issues that most of those people whom I criticize either are not aware of or do not respect, do not understand. Bourdieu says that bracketing out the social allows language or any other symbolic object to be treated like an end in itself. And this contributed considerably to the success of structural linguistics, just to be historical, for it endowed that pure exercises that characterize a purely internal and formal analysis 
with the charm of a game devoid of consequences. And what I'm going to claim is that those debaters today who claim that languages don't exist, mother tongues don't exist, there's uh, no or very little link between language and identity, they are also doing exactly this formal analysis with the charm of a game devoid of consequences or with very negative harmful consequences. Uh, task force on Aboriginal languages and cultures in uh, Canada have, uh, have published a report towards a new beginning, a foundational report for a strategy to revitalize First Nation Inuit and Metis languages and cultures. Uh, it was published in June and I had a wonderful conference with many of them in October. They say, among other things, and now remember these critics who say, oh, there's no, no link or very little link between language and identity, for instance. They say language and culture are not only words or syllables, but have spiritual links to the Creator. When I could pray in my own language, it was like the first breath I could take after being on a life support uh, respirator. Language and culture are an umbilical cord to the Creator. This was one of the uh, elders that they interviewed for this report. They also say language and culture cannot be separated from each other. If they are, the language only becomes a tool, a thing. Our language and culture are our identity and tell us who we are, where we came from and where we are going. We came from the land, this land, our land. We belong to it, are part of it and find our identities in it. Our languages return us again and again to this truth. This must be grasped to understand why the retention, strengthening and expansion of our First Nation, Inuit and Métis languages and cultures is of such importance to us and indeed to all Canadians and we could add to all humanity. And uh, this of course has to do with, among other things, the relationship between biodiversity and linguistic and cultural diversity, spiritual diversity and those who do not know about Terra Lingua, there are two uh, board members of Terra Lingua here, and everybody who has, who has even heard about Leon Hinton would know all of this. Uh, World Resources Institute and so on say cultural diversity is closely linked to biodiversity, humanity's collective knowledge of biodiversity and its use and management, rests in cultural diversity. Conversely, conserving biodiversity often helps uh, strengthen cultural integrity and values. Oh, now I went too far. And uh, Daryl Posey says, or said, biodiversity is not an object to be conserved, it's an integral part of human existence in which utilization is part of the celebration of life. And uh, I think we can put language here, likewise, linguistic diversity is not an object to be maintained. Uh, and you'll understand why, why I have this here, because of the nominalization debate. It is an integral part of human existence in which using the languages is part of the celebration of life. And then finally, I have a few quotes from Terra Lingua's website. Terra Lingua, actually you can read that yourselves. Okay, then, uh, I'm not in this talk interested in uh, the issues themselves that those whom I am going to criticize discuss, but I'm more interested in the consequences, in the global macro level consequences of what they say. And those consequences are or can be very, very harmful to indigenous peoples and uh, minorities. Uh, and I think the questions asked by organizers of a conference in Madrid in 2004, where we had uh, a very multidisciplinary conference with uh, biologists and lawyers and philosophers and so on, these questions that were posed by the organizers are extremely interesting. Partly what connections may exist between the loss of our biological heritage and that of our linguistic heritage, and with the, with the gradual loss of some languages, will we be losing at the same time 
priceless knowledge of other ways of inhabiting nature and of resources for sustainable development. And these questions, I think, are today absolutely vital, and they are not only vital for indigenous peoples and minorities, even if they are more directly vital for them, but they are vital for the whole humanity. So this is the background uh, that I use for talking to you today. First, I'll present an initial framework, which I then will relate to uh, at the end. And this comes from Tom Bartlett. And uh, uh, he has used, to some extent, uh, different groups, but I'm going to uh, modify. I am going to talk about it as different approaches to indigenous peoples and minorities by researchers, and especially then the researchers I'm going to criticize. And Tom calls this a typology of empowerment. He has two questions. Has the indigenous people or minority chosen the goals? And uh, is the indigenous people or minority itself realizing the goals? And you have different combinations. If you uh, answer no to both, then it is a question of paternalism as a research approach. If uh, the minority or indigenous people themselves, uh, if they themselves have chosen the goals, but are not realizing them, then it may be a question of advocacy on the part of the researchers. Co-optation is when, they, when the people, uh, people or peoples themselves have not chosen the goals, but they are realizing them, to some extent at least. And in transformative empowerment, they have both chosen the goals and they are uh, realizing them or participating in the realization. And I'm here thinking then of the goal that could be the maintenance of the mother tongue or mother tongues of indigenous peoples and minorities and bilingualism or language shift as a goal. And then uh, Tom also uh, defines participant roles in processes which determine their own course of action. And he talks about initiators, actors, beneficiaries and patients. Initiator role refers to any participant explicitly stated as initiating or authorizing a process undertaken either by themselves or by another participant. Actor refers to the participant explicitly or implicitly filling the actor role of each process. Beneficiary, those uh, for or on behalf of whom the text explicitly states that an action is carried out and to recipients of information or of goods and services. Revitalization could be one of the services. And patients are those on whom an action is carried out. And uh, this uh, builds on what Deborah Cameron and others wrote about uh, in 1992 in their very good book, where they talk about research on a minority group or on a group, research for a group, and research with a group. And obviously, research on a group is paternalistic, and you uh, create those on whom you do this research as uh, patients. And we can see the rest here. Uh, this is the last part of the uh, initial framework, and here I have related the participant roles in the debates that I'm going to discuss, debates on linguistic human rights, to the typology of empowerment. And I have changed quite a lot of what Tom Bartlett says. And I'm not going to go through this in detail now. I'll come back to it uh, uh, in my conclusions. But as you can say, uh, as you can see, both in both paternalism and cooptation, uh, indigenous peoples and minorities are made into patients. And when you look at the beneficiaries. Uh, it is claimed that indigenous peoples and minorities are the beneficiaries by a lot of those researchers whom I'm going to criticize. In transformation, the researchers themselves say, we are also benefiting from this research process because it is mutual and we are learning. So openness about what one as a researcher gets out of it is an important thing here. 
And then I have government researchers and indigenous peoples and minorities here. But I'll come back to that. Now I'm going to ask a few questions and then look at how the debates reply to these questions. My first question is, do indigenous peoples and minorities have the right themselves to decide, firstly, whether they have a named mother tongue or mother tongues? Or is this decided by researchers, here mainly linguists or sociolinguists, or government representatives, for instance school authorities or census authorities, who may build on what researchers have written or advised or advocated? And I'm also asking, are indigenous and minority voices heard and respected, or are they silenced, marginalized, ridiculed, stigmatized, etc.? My second question is, do indigenous peoples and minorities have the right to decide whether their mother tongues are an important part of their identities? Or is this decided by researchers? And likewise here, are their voices heard or are they silenced? Third question, do they have the right themselves to decide to what extent they want to maintain and develop their mother tongues? Or to what extent they want to leave their mother tongues behind and shift over to a dominant language? And I also ask other questions which I'm not going to have time to go into in this paper. And I have a fourth question which I won't go into at all. But then a fifth question, who initiates debates about these questions and who are active in the debates? Who stand to benefit from the debates, from the work that researchers are doing and from the processes that they are involved in? And then I'll just present my main thesis to you. I claim then that some researchers are today questioning the existence of the concepts of mother tongues and the concept of language and the importance of languages, mother tongues, for the identities of those indigenous peoples and minorities who themselves claim that these are important. And these researchers are very often, I claim, through using both false either-or argumentation and misrepresentation, questioning the importance and feasibility of the maintenance of these languages. At the same time, they are often posing as leftist, and or post-postmodern advocates for indigenous peoples and or minorities. And they are, I claim, in fact, involved in a, pattern, in a paternalistic power relationship. Their research often mainly benefits their own careers and either neoconservative or neoliberal forces. Their research may be either irrelevant for or even harm and prevent the realization of legitimate goals that indigenous peoples and minorities have set for themselves. And uh, I'll continue with David Huff, an American researcher who has lived in Japan more than 30 years, teaches through the medium of Japanese, and uh, he's counteracting the following claim uh, that somebody, somebody presented. This claim was many minority communities no longer care for their heritage languages and linguists often find it difficult to accept this fact. And David asks, how do you define communities, the leaders, selected individuals? And as for linguists finding the fact hard to accept, it seems to me that the opposite is true. He says, it is the linguists, at least the mainstream elitist ones, who are claiming this while at the same time avoiding responsibility for language shift, because they claim it's the community's fault, they don't want to maintain their language. And then these linguists get the lion's share of research funding without receiving the support of the community, because supposedly the community is not interested. And then they are doing research which is largely not needed and won't help anybody except the individual linguists themselves in climbing their respective career ladders. So I'm not the only one who is uh, making these claims. And I would also like to remind you of Joshua Fishman's uh, claim. More than most other authoritative specialists, the authorities of the education system are deeply implicated in planned language shift. Education is a very useful and highly irreversible language shift mechanism, and the usual postmodern crit critique meaning the type that I'm going to criticize, misses the boat completely. 
And then I'll uh, use a couple of quotes from Deloria again, in, from his book, uh, Custa Died for Your Sins, an Indian manifesto. He says uh, about anthropologists, something that I think uh, could be extended to many linguists. The fundamental thesis of the anthropologist is that people are objects for observation. People are then considered objects for experimentation, for manipulation, and for eventual extinction. Compilation of use useless knowledge for knowledge's sake should be utterly re rejected by Indian people. We should not be objects of observation for those who do nothing to help us. During the crucial days of 1954, when the Senate was pushing for termination of all Indian rights, not one single scholar, anthropologist, sociologist, historian, or economist came forward to support the tribes against this, uh, the detrimental policy. And then he tells about uh, Roger Jordan a couple of years ago, and he was chairman of the uh, Red Lake Chippewa tribe of Minnesota. He casually had the anthropologists escorted from his reservation. This was the tip of the iceberg breaking through into visibility. If only more Indians had the insight of Jordan, why should we continue to be the private zoos for anthropologists or linguists? Why should tribes have to compete with scholars for funds when the scholarly productions are so useless and irrelevant to real life? And he continues, I would advocate a policy to be adopted by Indian tribes which would soon clarify the respective roles of anthropologists and tribes. Each anthro desiring to study a tribe should be made to apply to the tribal council for permission to do his study. He would be given such permission only if he raised as a contribution to the tribal budget an amount of money equal to the amount he proposed to spend in his study. Anthropologists would thus become productive members of Indian society instead of ideological vultures. And I think that uh, this is a, a very accurate description of what some linguists are doing. I cannot imagine that there would be any linguist doing that in this room. They are fortunately outside this room. And uh, David Huff says, uh, likewise, to my mind there are some key issues here which we as linguists need to take seriously before we embark on our fieldwork projects. The first involves economics and the fact that we are often competing not only with ourselves, meaning other researchers, but with indigenous peoples for limited funds. More often than not, because as academics we are used to writing grant proposals, we win out and the indigenous communities lose. Because of this glass barrier, if you will, I have seen numerous instances where indigenous communities don't even bother to apply. And he would like to break down this insider-outsider uh, dichotomy and suggest certain professional standards whereby so-called experts only apply for funding after being invited to do so by and in support of indigenous communities. Such a, uh, such a statement should also make it clear that the data collected does not wind up collecting dust in some museum or library, but is used immediately by and for the community. And the last quote, unless the connection is made, what we wind up with, and this is so often the case, oh, I have the same, same part here. I would also suggest that unless that connection is made, it would be better to forego the data collection phase and move immediately into the application phase, which may sound funny for some of the researchers. But uh, David claims there are numerous ways of doing this based on the different kinds of projects that linguists engage in, and these could be specified separately. Okay, now I'm going to move to the real content then. All this was in, uh, in the way of introduction. And I have three claims, and then I'll... Uh, which uh, these uh, people that I criticize are making, then I present some counter-arguments and conclusions. The first claim has to do with nomina nominalizing languages. Do languages and thus mother tongues exist? Can they be named and even counted? And uh, th this has to do with my question one. Can uh, the people concerned do they have the right themselves to decide whether they have a named mother tongue or mother tongues? 
Uh, some theoretical attempts, and I'll give you examples, build on claims about the relationship between forms and functions and language, and then up, end up claiming that the so-called object of linguistic human rights, namely specific languages, do not exist. And one example, a very good example, is uh, Sinfrin McConnell's and Alistair Pennycook's article Disinventing and Reconstituting Languages. And the article is extremely complex and sophisticated, fairly comprehensive. It has lots of good insights and important analyses, but it is also full of contradictions, I claim. Many of the conclusions do not hold, and its consequences can be both destructive and dangerous. And in my view there, and many others, her argumentation fits into a neoliberal paradigm, and Petrovich 205 has very good definitions, even if many of these researchers concerned might detest the label of being neoliberal. Uh, here we go then, Makoni and Pennycook. Quote, we start with the premise that languages and metalanguages used to describe them are inventions. First, languages were in the most literal sense invented, particularly as part of the Christian colonial project and the emphasis are mine. Second, in a parallel process, a linguistic uh, meta-language was also invented. Thus, alongside the invention of languages, an ideology of languages as separate and innumerable categories was also created, an ideology founded on a nominal view of languages. Uh, an extreme extension of this nominal view of language and numerability arises when languages are treated as institutions a view reinforced by the existence of grammars and dictionaries. And uh, then they quote Reagan, there is, or at least there may well be, no such thing as English. Indeed, not only is there no such thing as English, but there's arguably no such thing as Russian, French, Spanish, Chinese, Hindi, or any other language. So when Gunn, for instance, uh, asked me this morning, do you speak Swedish? You made, you made a horrible uh, mistake, it's a sin, uh, nothing uh, such as the Swedish language exists according to this. We spoke it, but it doesn't exist. Uh, Maconi and Pennycook then continue, quoting Reagan's argument about why the notion of languages as fixed entities is problematic from both a historical and a social point of view. And they say then, historically, language, any language, is constantly changing and in flux, and thus any effort to demarcate the boundaries of a particular language are inevitably at best able to, pro to provide a snapshot of the language at a particular time and place. A language is ultimately a collection of idiolects which have been determined to belong together for what are ultimately non- and extra-linguistic reasons. And Reagan's concluding suggestion for a critical language awareness should employ a constructivist epistemology in order to reject the positivist objectiv ob objectification of language in favor of a more complex, sophisticated, and nuanced view of language. But uh, Maconi and Pennycook go much further than Reagan. And then we have uh, Jan Blomert, and he's much more contemptuous in his denouncement of language names. He says, language names such as English, French, uh, Swahili, or Chinese belong to the realm of folk ideologies of language, and popularized or institutionalized discourses anchored therein. Only every now and then are they salient as objects of sociolinguistic inquiry. So sociolinguists shouldn't study anything stupid like uh, the English language or the Russian language or, or Swahili or whatever. And a special object for, uh, for contempt, contempt for Blomert is language name using sociolinguists. Like most sociolinguists, and ironically this includes every single one that are criticizing this practice, they, uh, these who use names about languages. They have developed sophisticated discourses in which language names were metonymically used for the totality of language appearances. And this is something that one absolutely should not do. But still, Blomet himself is no exception. And uh, he does exactly what he accuses others, shoddy sociolinguists, for doing. 
In the same article, he describes in great detail his own anecdotal ethnographical observations, and he then uh, discusses young people who borrow from something that he calls English, even if English doesn't exist, into something that he calls Swahili. And uh, Blumen's characterization of his own work is the best possible sociolinguistics, at the same time as he characterizes the work of other sociolinguists, and especially Robert Philipson and myself, as shoddy. So we shoddy sociolinguists have, according to Blumet, ended up with a fundamentally flawed set of basic assumptions about language and society. And he also claims that this is true, equally true, of language planning, for instance, people like Fishman and Ferguson and Dasgupta, and of studies of multilingualism and code switching, and he, may, um, he names uh, Suzanne Romain and Carol Meyer Scott and, and so on. Sociolinguistics is, in his view, to a large extent, still plagued by such deeply idealized notions of language and society. Okay, then I'll uh, present counterclaims, four of them. Firstly, I claim that despite the vagueness of the concept or concepts of language, naming languages and listing named languages is necessary. Firstly, for hundreds of purposes, including decisions on the medium of education in schools, or support for endangered languages and for linguistic diversity, or for demanding basic linguistic human rights for language in general, and especially speakers, signers of named languages, we necessarily need some kind of ways of discussing and even enumerating languages. And these are perfectly legitimate concerns. Now, if I discuss with human rights lawyers what kind of linguistic human rights are needed, and if I then say, oh, there's nothing called languages, <laughs> how are they going to write anything about linguistic human rights? Completely impossible. Uh, Secondly, language is not mainly a concern for linguists or sociolinguists. It's a vital concern for the users of these languages. In addition, it's also a legitimate concern for researchers and practitioners in other disciplines, education, psychology, law, anthropology, political science, sociology, and so on. And most of these other users of the concept of language are, at least for the time being, not helped by and do not necessarily need to use the types of new insights into the need to disinvent language, at least until Pennycook and others come up with something better in the place of what they or we are using now. Many of these others operate with their own theories about languages. Uh, lawyers don't need to use linguists theories about what a language is, and in most cases they can't do it. And not respecting that other people from other disciplines have their own theories about language shows very little openness towards the way other ways other disciplines define the concepts they use. And likewise, if we, for instance, want to see what the correlation is between biodiversity on the one hand and linguistic and cultural diversity on the other hand, some measures of linguistic and cultural diversity have to be found, and we need to use the concept of language for those measures. Just like the number of species has been used as a proxy for biodiversity, the number of languages can and has been used as a crude proxy for linguistic diversity. And David Harmon from Terra Lingua has a very good discussion about uh, the caveats in both these proxies. And it's absolutely clear, of course, the whole concept of language is very vague. And that's not the point. But an example is that the latest edition of the Ethnologue lists some 6,900 languages, but around 41,000 names or labels for various languages. But even if we knew what a language is, we certainly have extremely unreliable figures about the number of speakers for most of them, including the really large ones like Chinese or Spanish or, or uh, Bengali or Hindi or English. And uh, as you know, English is, according to the ethnologue, uh, now only the fourth largest language in the world in terms of native speakers. So we have very, very bad estimates for these languages. and. Uh, we are not claiming that the concept is precise or that we know a lot about these languages. And likewise, 
if we want to distinguish mother tongue speakers or native speakers, first primary language speakers, from those who have learned some languages only later and for whom it was not their primary means of communication in childhood, uh, we are using contested concepts. And obviously all of us know that and accept that. But the fact that the concepts language and linguistic diversity are vague and contested should make us work harder to make them more precise. And if this inventing them, the way Pennycook and others want to do, can do this, that's fine. But I'm afraid that urgent political and pragmatic concerns cannot wait until they have disinvented and then reinvented languages. Uh, thus I claim that using the concept of language and naming and listing languages is necessary for pragmatic reasons and to show respect for other disciplines' way, uh, uh, ways of theorizing languages. Second counter-argument, languages can be named despite of constant change, because change is the norm in everything living. So I'm asking here, does the fact that languages are constantly changing and that we can only provide a snapshot at a particular time and place, does that negate the existence of these languages? Can we not name languages because they are changing? Is it really true that we cannot speak about anything called English because what was called English, for instance, 200 years ago looked completely different from what is called English today. And here uh, I'm talking about English regardless of the social and gender and geographic variations of yester centuries and today's Englishes. And uh, I uh, am using a parallel. When I was born in 1940, I was called Tove Skutnop. And I've gone through many changes, even metamorphoses, both physically and psychologically. And even if my DNA is still, still the same, every single cell in my body has changed many times, just like, for instance, vocabularies or pronunciation of languages change. Even physically, but especially psychologically, external circumstances, many if not most outside my control, are responsible for many of these changes and compare with languages all the time. So socio-political circumstances and I myself have constructed and reconstructed and disinvented and reinvented Tove Skutnap time and time again. And still both I and my family and long-term friends and shorter-term friends still call me Tove and recognize me as Tove despite all these constant changes. And this obviously means that what was Tove uh, 65 years ago and what was called Tove yesterday and will be called if I live then 17th of March 2007, they are all changing snapshots. But still, there is some kind of essence in the Tuveness, <laughs> which allows me and others to call me Tuve. And I'm asking then, is, the, is it not the same with languages? Now somebody might say, okay, this may be true for something that has a material existence, like a person. But if languages are mainly seen not as something that is frozen in a grammar, but something that is being performed every minute. Then you have to use a parallel that has the same quality of being non-material. And I think that's fair enough. So let's hear what some indigenous people's representatives say about traditional knowledge. This knowledge is in no way static either, and I'm going to quote Four Directions Council in Canada. What they say is, what is traditional about traditional knowledge is not its antiquity, but the way it is acquired and used. In other words, the social process of learning and sharing knowledge, which is unique to each indigenous culture, lies at the very heart of its, of its traditionality. Much of this knowledge is actually quite new, meaning it has changed a lot. But it has a social meaning and legal character entirely unlike the knowledge indigenous people acquire from settlers and industrialized societies. So if those who are guardians of this traditional knowledge still call it traditional, even if they know and accept that the body of that knowledge is in constant flux in several ways, then it should be equally possible to see change as an inherent and necessary characteristic of not only knowledge or languages, but of everything living. And knowledge and languages are living in this sense. They are not any kind of museal objects. Thus, to conclude here, constant change does not in any way make the existence of languages less real. They can be named, and mother tongues are also languages in this sense to those who claim them, 
regardless of whether they or others call them languages or dialects or variants or varieties or whatever. They do have an existence. And mother tongues can thus be named too. And I'll come back to the importance in the next two counter-arguments. But I think it's interesting that metaphorically languages have been called the DNA of cultures. So just like uh, my DNA is still the same, uh, despite cells having been changed, having been changed, languages can be called the DNA of cultures. Third counter-argument, social constructedness does not invalidate languages as concepts. <coughs> so a third reason why, why languages should be disinvented seems uh, for the critics to be that they are, as Maconi and Pennico claim, invented, socially constructed by missionaries. And they claim we start with the premise that languages are inventions. First languages were, in the most literal sense, invented, particularly as, the, as part of the Christian colon, colonial project. It seems that several of these critics somehow automatically assume that if something is constructed rather than innate or inherited or primordial or natural or whatever we, see, we can see as, uh, as the opposite of constructed, it's somehow a less valid cons- concept because of this. Knowing and accepting that a concept like mother tongue, language, ethnicity, culture is socially constructed does, in my view, not in any way need to invalidate the concept. All science, for instance, is socially constructed, and still our conclusion is not that we should stop talking about science or stop using it, or that we should somehow disinvent the concept of science, even if we can be and must be reflective and critical of its claims. The socio-historical circumstances that have created languages need to be described and analyzed, and Maconi and Penicuk are doing this admirably for some periods of certain colonial situations, mainly in Africa. But they overgeneralize their analysis hugely, so that they almost give the impression that all of the world's languages are inventions by European missionaries for colonial purposes. And this is, of course, a completely invalid argument because what translates as languages with characteristics that we still impute to languages have existed in various parts of the world for thousands of years before Christianity was created and before the start of colonialism with the Christian missionaries. Likewise, Maconi and Pennycook used the colonial construction of certain languages as a proof that nothing such as a language exists, and I think that's a very, very impermissible leap, even if it is true for a few African languages, certainly. And thirdly, uh, these two build up a catch-22 dichotomy where the verbal expressions of people are treated by them either as social constructs, therefore not real languages, or they are treated as primordial in a Herderian sense, and thus equally invalid, because researchers like myself are here claimed to be essentializing and objectifying languages and thus also creating them in an impermissible way. So uh, uh, either this or that you can't win. And uh, I would also like to add that few, if any, of their arguments apply to sign languages. And of course sign languages are languages in an equally full sense as uh, spoken languages. Thus the social constructedness of the concept of language and mother tongue does not invalidate them as concepts. And my last counter-argument here, uh, I think that these linguists uh, crusade against their own creation. One of the causes for the problem that they uh, criticize and that they have is completely of their own making. And there here means linguists and sociolinguists. What linguists see and study as languages are creation, are a creation by linguists, not a creation by those who use the languages. The critics seem to equate, uh, to equate the language whose existence they criticize with the object that a traditional hardcore linguists study and analyze and write uh, rules for and standardize and capture in books and so on, thus freezing them. Long ago, Peter Trudgill uh, defined a language as opposed to something below a language, for instance dialects, on the basis of its degree of standardization. And he claimed then that real languages needed to be written down, otherwise they were not languages. And they needed to have grammar books and dictionaries and other paraphernalia created by linguists, otherwise they were not languages. He has unfortunately changed his mind long ago. 
But this way of looking at languages, I feel, represents very deep scientific colonialism, where something becomes real when and only when the representatives of science, in this case linguists, missionaries, as colonizers, discover them. Just like Columbus discovered America, linguists discover these languages. They don't exist otherwise, they are not languages otherwise. So when they discover them by molding them according to their norms and reducing them to analyzable snaps, uh, snapshot texts. And the part of, uh, of uh, this uh, Makoni Pinnacle article where they criticized the way missionaries invented languages and appropriated for mi missionary colonial purposes often distorted variants of what people in uh, colonies spoke is a much needed description of linguistic colonization. But it's interesting that they do not seem to see that they themselves use an equally colonizing concept of what language is by equating languages or language with those frozen and often distorted and always deficient snapshots, which are the creations of linguists. This is a crusade against their own invention. So there and other integrationists critique of this kind of language is something where linguists first create their own version of what language is reducing language to something that makes only linguists, meaning not ordinary users, the experts of languages and language, uh, languageness, and afterwards they start a crusade against this concept, meaning against their own creations. And conclusions from this. Uh, uh, the content in all these debates is pretty relevant for those who live and perform these languages every day. And thus also for speakers, users, revitalizers of indigenous endangered languages. Thus linguists are the initiators of the debates, now I go back to my initial framework, and linguists are the only actors in them, and the only beneficiaries are their own careers, and in many cases directly or indirectly neoconservative and neoliberal forces. Some of the results can be and are already being used to ridicule those who still believe that they have mother tongues and who use named languages. And these despised groups who still have mother tongues probably include not only most indigenous peoples and minorities of the world, but also most ordinary language users, including sign language users, meaning a large part of humanity. And in addition to researchers such as myself, they also include most of those people who directly or indirectly, in and through their work, decide what kind of presence the world's indigenous and minority languages and their speakers are to have in various domains such as education. And by negating or ridiculing mother tongues as concepts, as outmoded or passé or whatever, they may support their invisibilization in precisely those areas where the transfer of indigenous and minority languages to the next generations is being decided. And the pressure to conformity and to showing that one knows of and even accepts the latest fads is such that even researchers who, whose own empirical studies counteract the claims of the fads seem to feel uncertain. And I think Suras Kanagraja is a very good example. And I'll uh, show a couple of quotes from him. He studies Tamils in Tamil Elam in Sri Lanka. Even if uh, Surashi's informants, both community members and Tamil political leaders, use the term mother tongue, and even when he can show that its promotion enables social mobility for community members, uh, he has become insecure about the use of the term mother tongue. And now, uh, before I show the quotes, it might be important to stress that people obviously can have more than one mother tongue, and this has for a long time been an accepted fact in how mother tongues are defined, because when we define mother tongues, we say the language, all languages, first learned, identified with, best known, and so on. So we always use it in, in uh, plural. You can have two or even three mother tongues. And this is what uh, Suresh says. The term vernacular is somewhat ambiguous. The use of the term mother tongue might be an alternative. However, it is becoming outmoded in the context of multilingualism. As people increasingly acquire more than one language from their childhood, sometimes with parents themselves speaking different languages. But he says the term Tai Moli, mother tongue, is used for Tamil by political leaders and community members. 
The policy of mother tongue revival is not in opposition to the interests of individual mobility, it enables mobility. Indigenous peoples and minorities, voices have been more or less completely absent in the debates, or if they have been quoted at all, they have been ridiculed, not respected. They have had no right themselves to decide whether they have a name mother tongue or mother tongues. This has been decided by researchers. In practice, most government representatives know nothing about the debates yet, but they are, there are already cases, for instance in Norway right now, where some school authorities are using support from these researchers to silence minority mother tongues in schools, to stop teaching any minority mother tongues in schools because mother tongues don't exist. The lack of respect is even more pronounced in relation to the second question about the importance of mother tongues. And now I come to the second, and it will be much shorter, and my third one is very short. Essentializing languages, the relationship between language mother tongue and identity as prerequisites for demanding linguistic human rights. And this question had to do with whether uh, minorities have the right themselves to decide whether their mother tongues are an important part of their identities. And some of the claims I'll just sum up here. Uh, the claims say language is not an important or even necessary feature in the construction of individual or collective identities. The existence of multiple linguistic identities and hybridity show that there is no link between language and identity. If there was a strong link, there would be no or little language shift. Stephen May summarizes his own views and claims there's a widespread consensus in social and political theory and increasingly in sociolinguistics and critical applied linguistics that language is at most a contingent factor of one's identity. In other words, language does not define us and may not be an important factor or indeed even a necessary one in the construction of our, our identities, whether at the individual or collective level. The consequences of this kind of a view are pretty obvious, because if language use were merely a surface factor feature of ethnic identity, then adopting another language would only affect the language use aspect of our ethnic identity, and not the identity itself. And thus the loss of a particular language is not the end of the world for a particular ethnic identity. The latter simply adapts to the new language. Uh, Carol Eastman says there's no need to worry about preserving ethnic identity so long as the only change being made is in what, langu uh, is in what language we use. And the fact that many people have more than uh, one mother, mother tongue is also seen as, pr as proof for the thesis of no link between language ad and identity. Because hybrid people can have no roots, ethnically or linguistically, and rootedness is seen as essentialism. Uh, uh, Stephen May again, hybridity theory is entirely opposed to universalism, traditionalism and any idea of ethnic, cultural and by extension linguistic rootedness. Holding on to the idea of a link between a particular language and identity thus seems not only ir irremediably passé but unrealistic, since multiple identities including multiple linguistic identities are now the order of the day. Clearly then, an acceptance of the contingent nature of the language identity link and the wider principle of hybridity is a necessary prerequisite before minority language rights can continue to develop further theoretically, even if some other prominent advocates of uh, minority language rights are still loath to countenance such a move, for, for example, me. And a kind of garage of people are not prepared to think of their identities in essentialist terms as belonging exclusively to one language and culture. As these constructs are losing their status as bounded and objective entities, and we recognize their constructed fluid and hybrid nature, scholars are beginning to doubt that sound policies can be based on such nebulous constructs as mother tongues and identity. A third type of proof of the lacking link between language ad and identity builds on rational choice theory. People weigh different alternative strategies and choose the one that maximizes their benefits and profit. If the link between language and identity were strong, the benefits of maintaining a mother tongue would weigh more than shifting to a dominant language. And of course it doesn't, uh, in their view. 
When applied to the ethnic identity language choice nexus, the cost opportunity approach of the rational, uh, rational choice theory would indicate clearly that particular languages do not define us and may not be an important feature or even a necessary one in the construction of our identities. After all, how else can we explain the exponentially increasing phenomenon of language shift? So indigenous peoples have had no uh, link between their identity and their language. Had they had that, they would never have shifted and we wouldn't need to revitalize any languages, according to these researchers. And I have very short summing up of my counter-arguments. Languages are often core values for individual and collective ethnocultural identities. Identities are variable, are changing. Endangered parts of identities are often focused. Elite dominant language speakers whose own languages may never have been threatened may have great difficulty in grasping this. And those rejecting linguistic rootedness as a grand narrative of Herderian romanticizing essentialism, like May and the Pennycook and so on, may instead, I feel, of rejecting all grand narratives as they claim, be in the process of constructing a new grand narrative of rootless hybridity as a necessary and positive ideal for elites fighting alienation. Putting languages, cultures, ethnici ethnicities and identities together, regardless of how they are defined, is admittedly risky, since there are many examples of non-convergence every way. For instance, we have several cultural groups using the same language, or one cultural group using two or three different languages. And when ethnicity, also a contested concept, is added so that we get ethnocultural groups defined and self-identifying on the basis of languages, like uh, we do in Theralingua in some measures, the measures become even more, more vague. And obviously that is something that we admit. Likewise, all the concepts used, language, mother tongue, culture, ethnicity, are obviously social constructs. They are not inherited givens, but they are dynamic and they are changing. They are not static. People may claim several of them at the same time and be multilingual, multicultural, multi-ethnial or bicultural, as some of my old students said they were. All of the concepts play ever-changing roles for people's multiple identities. They are variously focused and emphasized in various situations and at various times, and their salience is always variable. All identities are constructive to the extent that, uh, that we are not born with any kind of identity genes. Even in cases where we are talking about phenotypically visible genotypic features like skin color, very obviously the way these features are interpreted are social constructs, they are not innate. But with all these caveats, it's still the case that many of those groups who demand linguistic human rights do claim these concepts. They claim to know what their mother tongues are. They claim to know which ethnic or ethno-linguistic or eth ethnocultural group or groups they belong to. And they, they claim that their languages are important, even the core of their identities, as both people, individuals, and as peoples collectively. Most indigenous peoples who are pronounced on their languages share the attitudes from Canada, uh, which are described here, and this comes from from protection of First Nations languages, a special uh, uh, from the Special Chiefs Assembly. And uh, what they say is, uh, whereas language is a direct gift from the Creator, and whereas First Nations languages are the cornerstone of who we are as a people, and whereas our culture cannot survive without our languages, and whereas the right to use and educate our children in our Aboriginal languages is an inherent Aboriginal and treaty right, Therefore, be it resolved that, as Aboriginal people of this country, First Nations languages must be protected and promoted as a fundamental element of Aboriginal heritage and must be fully entrenched in the Constitution of Canada. And the federal government has a moral and legal obligation through pre-confederation treaties and legislation to provide adequate resources that will en enable First Nations languages to exercise this right. So there is, in reality, a very high degree of convergence between ethnicity, culture and mother tongue, quite regardless of how much liberal political scientists or post-postmodern sociolinguists want to denounce this and the concepts. I have not seen more than a few dozens of examples of non-convergence, and they seem always to be the same ones. And even if there were several hundreds of them, they would still be exceptions rather than a rule. 
And even if exceptions are important as checks on theories, generalizations cannot build on exceptions, but on what is more common. Several of the colleagues I'm criticizing uh, seem to try to raise these exceptions to rules in an eagerness not to be accused of essentialism. And likewise, the same very few examples of loss of language with the culture and identity still living on, the Irish, the Jews, and a few more, are always repeated and then used as proofs when claiming that there's little or no relationship between language and culture. Uh, Smolich and Seacom has, have in their core value theory first stated that other cultural factors such as specific religion, social structure, racial affiliation may prove to be of equal or greater significance than language for some peoples. However, they have attested in several books and articles to the fact that most cultures in fact do not last many generations after the language has disappeared and that for most people in their studies, language is one of the most important, if not the most important, core value. Several of the initial quotes which I read to you also testify to this, and almost regardless of which self-declarations one reads from indigenous peoples, this connection is affirmed. And Fishman's book the, on the beloved language consists of this kind of quotes from many different groups all over the world. And this implies for me that if we really mean it when we call for respect for people's self-identification, these claims should be respected. People's own self-identification should be more important than outside researchers' exocategorizations of people. And in terms of how people experience those features of their life that may be important aspects of their identities, obviously the very fact that some of them, like languages, have been learned in early childhood give them a special character that is not the same for features acquired later. And accepting this is not essentializing, I claim. It's just accepting that small children experience the world in a different way from cognitively more mature adults. And linguists who claim otherwise know too little about child psychology and psychiatry. We should listen to those who are aware of these connections, like uh, Gloria Anzaldua in How to Tame a Wild Tongue. She says, if you want to really hurt me, talk badly about my language. Ethnic identity is twin skin to linguistic identity. I am my language. And I would have thousands of quotes of this kind. I'll, uh, this kind. I'll quote another uh, author, uh, contemporary Danish writer, Susan Gregg. She spent most of her childhood in Thailand and Sri Lanka, but lives since over 35 years in a very small village in Denmark. And she feels strongly connected to this village. It is her home. And still, she says, it's not her native place. She says, I feel like I'm home when I'm here, but this is not my native place, because that's the place where one originates. There is no place that is my native place. I'm a globalized nomad, meaning the kind of people uh, that uh, Kanagaraja and all the others uh, use to claim that uh, the link between identity and uh, mother tongue doesn't exist. Having said that, that she is a globalized nomad, I do want to add that even if I speak many languages, I'm never going to speak any other language as well as I speak Danish. Neither will I ever have as deep a frame of reference to anything else as I have to uh, Danish songs, literature, and fairy tales. I would claim that literature, and she means uh, Danish literature, is my native place. So my partial conclusion here is then that many of the elites among native speakers of English or some other a big dominant language may be especially English monolinguals, but also many multilinguals, need much more awareness of the non-market value of their own often non-threatened dominant mother tongues. They often lack awareness completely of the non-market value of other people's mother tongues and the fact that they themselves benefit unjustly from the market value of their own dominant languages. They often lack awareness of what their own mother tongues mean, also for their identities, because these have not been threatened. If we want to be charitable, this lack of awareness may be partially responsible for the belittling claims that they make about indigenous and minority mother tongues. But the participation in the enforced language shift and linguistic genocide that many of them directly or indirectly advocate cannot be explained by lack of information or lack of awareness only. 
indigenous peoples and minorities voices have been more or less completely absent also in these debates. Or if they have been quoted, they have been ridiculed, not respected. Romantic blah blah. Mother Earth and all of that. Oh. They have had no right themselves to decide to what extent their mother tongues or, or mother tongue or mother tongues are an important part of their identities. This has been decided by researchers. And when they have claimed that their mother tongues are not only important but inseparable from their identities, they have been ridiculed, stigmatized, marginalized, silenced. The lack of respect for their views is absolutely extreme. And their identities have mostly been studied by outsiders who have been the only ones to profit from these studies. And then my last claim, maintaining languages and forced language shift from indigenous and minority languages is linguistic genocide and does not support the learning of dominant languages or integration. And this is my claim. And here I ask, uh, do minorities have the right to decide to what extent they want to maintain and develop their mother tongues or shift to a dominant language? And <clears throat> some of these claims present examples of misrepresentations and false claims about linguistic diversity and proponents of linguistic human rights. They claim that proponents of linguistic human rights want to keep indigenous, min indigenous peoples and minorities in museal conditions. We want to prevent them from modernizing, uh, these people claim. And they also claim that uh, indigenous peoples and minorities do not want to learn dominant languages. They want to isolate and ghettoize themselves. And they also present a lot of false dichotomies. And uh, I'll give you a few quotes. Even very respected researchers like Patton and Kimlika say things are complicated by linguistic diversity. Linguistic diversity is one of the most important obstacles to building a strong sense of European citizenship. Linguistic diversity is a problem, so why should we keep it? Uh, Leighton and Reich, uh, two Stanford professors, their favorite term about people who want small languages to survive is that we are, uh, Leanne, did you know, you are a linguistic entrepreneur of minority groups. Minority parents who want mother tongue medium education are regional separatists, according to them. And uh, what they want to do is to empower states to constrain parents from so limiting their children's language, uh, language repertoires. So if minority parents want their kids to learn their own language, they are limiting uh, the children's language repertoires. And they demand that minority parents provide linguistic repertoires to their children that allow them a meaningful range of choices as adults, meaning both mother tongue and English minimally, but rather English only. They do not demand that dominant group parents provide linguistic repertoires to their children that allow them a meaningful range of choices of adults. Uh, these children are allowed to remain happily monolingual, according to uh, Leighton and, Re and Reich. And they say about Europe, we can well imagine the decision of some small national minorities in Europe say Italian Swiss or Hungarian Slovaks, that their lives would go better if they were to give up speaking Italian or Hungarian and seek their professional and political fortune in the German or French or English speaking parts of the European Union. Why Hungarian and where is Slovak here? So according to them, knowing Hungarian, which has 14 and a half million speakers in 11 countries, or Italian with 62 million speakers in 30 countries, is of no use for anybody's professional or political fortune. And poor Slovak with only 5.6 million speakers in eight countries is not even worth mentioning, despite Slovak being well among the 200 largest languages in the world, and the spoken languages. It's also interesting that the Slovak language is not even mentioned because suggesting that a minority, meaning the Hungarian-speaking Slovaks, should give up speaking the dominant official language in the country where they live is also interesting. And I'm asking then, would Leighton and Reich make the same suggestion to minorities in the US that they should give up speaking the dominant language in the country, namely English? And if not, where are the universal principles that they claim to follow in their theorizing? So to me, it seems like it's English only being spread to Europe, too, by two Stanford professors. <laughs> uh, other ideological misconceptions 
Kimlikan pattern, they claim that minorities, no, they present minorities as somehow reluctant, unable or unwilling to learn the dominant language. Uh, minorities are claimed to become ghettoized so that even the second and third generations of immigrant groups will live and work predominantly in their ancestral language with only minimal or non-existent command of the state language. So nobody here learns English in this country, according to them. And not forcing minorities to linguistic integration, which they uh, use when they mean assimilation, with standardized public education in a common language, meaning English, serves to separate citizens into distinct and mutually antagonistic groups. And uh, I'll quote uh, Lava de Avasti from the Ministry of Education in Nepal. Here is uh, Lava with his dear supervisor when he defended his PhD thesis. Lava said uh, to me in a letter, we also face a problem with elite capturing inside the country, which appears to be more difficult than we thought. The elite are trying to, re to resist change, and uh, there are more than 100 languages in Nepal, and Lava wants all of the minorities and indigenous peoples to have mother tongue medium education, with, of course, Nep Nepali as a subject and English as a subject and so on. So the elite are trying to resist change. But we have to continue putting pressure on them. That ultimately is also in their interest. We are saying that if they do not support mother tongue medium programs, there will be more Maoists and there will be bigger conflict in the country. And as you know, there is a very, very horrifying civil war in Nepal right now. We tell them that insurgency is the result of our indifference to ethnic and linguistic minority children's education in the past. We are preparing a national plan of action for education for all implementation. We have succeeded in making children's linguistic rights a major issue in Nepal's education for all framework. We have convinced the development partners that unless non-Nepali speaking children have access to mother tongue medium education, Nepal cannot achieve education for all goals by 2015. But it is the elites in their own country that are the difficult ones of course, because they benefit. According to some researchers, indigenous peoples and minorities are not only unwilling to learn the dominant languages, they are also unwilling to learn and maintain their own languages. Learning them is something, again, that we unrealistic, essentializing romantics force on them. They don't want to learn these languages. Christine of Rathpolston claimed that immigrant minority children, given the chance, would like to assimilate and become good Swedes. We've shown that this is not the case. Many members of marginalized groups would prefer linguistic assimilation, even if it were not ideolo ideologically coerced. It is an individual right to exit a minority language group, and these individual rights are not to be overridden by the interests of subgroups in coercively maintaining the loyalty of their members. So we are coercively maintaining the loyalty of, of our minority group members so that they learn the languages. And a liberal society cannot adopt policies designed to keep a language in existence if those who speak it prefer to let it go. Uh, proponents of linguistic human rights who write about the alleged uh, intrinsic value of particular languages and of particular linguistic communities seem to, according to Weinstock, have the need to preserve such languages and communities even against the decisions of their own members. Individual choices can fail to reflect people's actual linguistic preferences because in an unrestricted context they are dangerous to their acting on their ideal preferences that they have a paramount interest in avoiding. So to me, this is uh, these uh, liberal political scientists functioning as vulgar Marxists without knowing it. And I can't recognize this world where minority entrepreneurs force poor, unwilling minority members to continue speaking this useless minority language against their will, and where we force people into cultural milieus from which they might want to exit or where we are turning cultural minorities into the equivalent of endangered species that warrant preservation for the sake of maintaining diversity. Ideological coercion, manufacturing consent, some of the ways we, uh, the, uh, some of the ways the need to language shift uh, 
is created, use arguments about the dominant and dominated languages that recreate the unequal power relationships between them, them on false grounds. And uh, some of you might have seen this, uh, uh, this uh, table about the types of power and arguments for English. We can have innate power, resource power, structural power, Johann Galtung, peace researcher. And uh, for these we can use uh, being power arguments. English is a very reflective language, very uh, flexible. Having power, English has masses of grammar books, masses of materials. Position power, what English does for you, uh, it gives you good jobs and so on. And I have here a list of uh, these false dichotomies about what languages represent and can or cannot do in terms of that. I have uh, tried to, uh, to combine a lot of the arguments which are being used by those I criticize. Here are innate power, being power, uh, language is, language intrinsic arguments, arguments used about the minority languages of sentimental value, uh, association, nostalgic, symbolic pride in a mythic past and so on, the irrelevant, quaint, antediluvian, stati static, monolithic, archaic entities and so on. Whereas when the dominant languages are described, they are described in very positive terms. And I have similar uh, arguments uh, which I have collected here about resource power, what these languages have, and also about structural power, what they can do and uh, you can see them later. Uh, it seems to me that the validity of all dominant language intrinsic arguments, language is, is questionable, to say the least, as is the validity of many of the extrinsic arguments. Even so, the same old arguments are still used by many of the researchers whose work I'm critically discussing. And that means that the same power relations which Maconi and Pennycook described for colonial times and which uh, Robert Philipson has analyzed in depth for English, are still at work to ensure that many of the English functional arguments, what English can do, you get a good job if you know it, and so on, continue to hold sway even when many indigenous peoples have refuted them. And many indigenous and minority researchers have really shown that, firstly, indigenous language can, if granted a fair share of resources, perform many, if not all, of the same functions as dominant language. Secondly, and this is really important uh, from the global point of view, there are many other functions that indigenous languages can perform, not only for indigenous peoples themselves. These languages might be able to perform for the benefit of all humanity, functions that many dominant languages are today either not being put to perform or that they in many cases cannot perform today. Indigenous and local languages may do this through sharing traditional ecological, cognitive, spiritual and ideological knowledge encoded in them. And this knowledge may be vital for saving the planet or at least prerequisites for human existence on the planet. And uh, my question three was here. Uh, do uh, people have the right to maintain, to decide uh, whether or not they want to maintain and develop their languages. And my conclusion on this last question is that they do not have the right themselves to decide to what extent they want to maintain and develop their mother tongues and have not had this right for a long time. They do not have the right themselves to decide to what extent they want to leave their mother tongues behind and shift over to a dominant language. New conservative and neoliberal external forces do the, their best to try to force them, in most cases against their will, to assimilate. Members of the groups are being forcibly transferred to the dominant group, and the researchers I criticize supply many of the arguments to show that this is in the best interest of the indigenous peoples and minorities. And if we look at Article 2 in the present uh, United Nations Genocide Convention. It says that in the present convention, genocide means any of the following acts committed with, the, with intent to destroy in whole or in part a national, ethnical, racial or religious group as such. And uh, as you know, the Genocide Convention is from 1948. The United States has signed and ratified it. Here are the uh, definitions, and I'm only going to show you two of them because three of them 
uh, are about physical killing, physical destruction, but the two that are important here are genocide is forcibly transferring children of the group to another group and causing serious bodily or mental harm to members of the group. And this is what I claim that these researchers are participating in doing through the false argumentation. And then I'll just conclude, and there is not much here. Uh, reproduction of unequal power relationships uh, through trying to colonize the consciousness of people. First, there's glorification of the dominant languages, cultures, uh, ways of uh, living and so on, stigmatization of indigenous peoples and minorities, and then the most dangerous one, of these three processes through which unequal power relations are reproduced, namely to rationalize the relationship between dominant groups and dominated groups, economically, politically, psychologically, educationally, sociologically, linguistically, etc., so that what the dominant group or groups do including the linguists that I have been, been criticizing, always seems functional and beneficial to the minorities, subordinated groups, because the dominant groups or individuals are helping them, giving them aid, civilizing them, modernizing them, teaching democracy, the United States in Iraq and so on, granting rights, protecting world peace, etc. And this rationalization, I feel, is the most dangerous part of it. So, thus, stigmatizing dominated languages and their speakers, glorifying dominant languages and their speakers, and rationalizing the relationship between them helps to support and legitimate and recreate present disastrous power relationships. And by silencing, marginalizing, and ridiculing these indigenous voices through paternalistic relationships, many researchers are certainly working against the interests of those who want another world the one which in the World Social Forum's world is, uh, words is possible. And if we ask who initiate the debates about these questions and who are active in the debates and who stand to benefit from the debates, from the work that researchers are doing and from the processes they are involved in, you remember this uh, initial framework. I then claim that in most cases, researchers and government representatives initiate the discussions. They perform many of the actions around the non-maintenance of indigenous and minority languages, and indigenous voices about their maintenance are silenced. Some indigenous peoples participate in the actions, very few in the initiation. And indigenous peoples and minorities are, through all these arguments, created as and they become patients. Some of them can reap some short-term benefits, but in the end, the benefits for them and for the whole of humanity are minor or non-existent. And often the harm caused to them through the forcible transfer to dominant groups is serious and long-term. And this fulfills two of the definitions of genocide in the UN Genocide Convention. Most of the neoliberal research criticized here is either paternalistic or sometimes co-option oriented and researchers' careers benefit. And then uh, last quotes, and I quote here Harta Negri, I'm asking is linguistic imperialism, which I think these uh, people I've criticized are part of, is it part of modern agentless imperialistic control? And uh, Harta Negri define empire first, and then they say empires form not on the basis of force itself, but on the basis of the capacity to present force <coughs> as being in the service of right and peace. And this is what I think is happening here. Uh, Tiro Kandaya analyzes scholars who couch their analysis in radical progressive language, as many of the ones I have criticized do, and he's skeptical of studies that do not represent a real encounter with the material realities of the relevant socio-historical context, especially when either metropolitan and post-colonial scholars couch their analysis in radical progressive language without adequately theorizing what resistance is or the dominant academic ideologies. And he sees much language policy as essentially floundering in a state of explanatory impoverishment, much of the exercise being removed from the determinate realities of its material context into a perpetually uncertain and ambivalent world of textual hermeneutics. 
and what I would like to have instead and uh, what I think these discussions sh should lead to is in Ron Collins, uh, Ron Collins' terms, in fields in which language works as a central focus and a tool of change, this discussion should focus on the socio-political consequences of our concepts of language and culture. I believe that language pedagogy is a significant tool of political power. I believe that only where the tools of power are openly known, openly critiqued and accessible to everyone can anything like a true democracy work. And the last quote from Daryl Posey about the role of us as researchers, scientists. In fact, science is far behind the environmental movement. It still sees nature as objects for human use and exploitation. Technology has used the banner of scientific objectivity to mask the moral and ethical issues that emerge from such a functionalist anthropocentric philosophy. The dominant scientific and economic forces assume that traditional communities must change to meet modern standards, but indigenous and tra traditional peoples feel the opposite must occur. Science and industry must begin to respect local diversity and the sacred balance. Science and industry have lost their legitimate role as responsible global leaders. And that is where I will finish. Thank you so much. for having had the tolerance of listening to me for one and a half hours. Thank you, almost at least. Thank you very much.